identifying and tracking produce from the packing house to the supermarket. It's technology to help ensure we know what we're buying and where it came from. I'm Jacqueline London, reporting. Okay, what you notice? One, we tried to show something about how science is good for the American public. And secondly, we always try to have the face of a scientist that happens to have been a physicist and to show that this is something that physics is good for. Okay, I'll show you one more piece. on YouTube is all it takes to see the devastating power and violent shaking earthquakes can cause without warning. The massive quake in Japan makes John A. Jones think back to Northridge 1994. She was 11 when one of California's largest quakes hit before sunrise. And I just remember uh, waking up to a very violent shake. And I remember trying to scream, and I nothing came out. Now, John A. works at SOS Survival Products. Here, it's all about being disaster ready. This is one of our pre-designed earthquake kits. Over at Caltech, structural engineer and geophysicist Swami Natsan Krishnan whips up disasters using his fingers. He's an earthquake engineer using these state-of-the-art 3D simulators to create earthquakes and recreate historic ones to see how much shaking big structures can handle in various locations. We place computer models of buildings or bridges at these different locations and then look at their response. And they could be collapsing, they may have a lot of damage. By assessing the fake quakes effects on the 3D models and studying the simulated ground motion, Christian gets real results. He says the findings could help improve building codes, cut down on disaster response time, even help people decide what kind of disaster insurance they need. Every earthquake teaches us something new. Trying out possibilities before the next earthquake hits okay. and taking seismology we'll to a new dimension. I'm Andrew McIntosh reporting. Okay. That's what the stations get. Uh, the footage, a script, but most stations don't like to use voices other than their own. Most stations want to make it their own. And so what I'm going to do is now show a couple of pieces that show what a station has done with something. I started using the same piece that if I decided that will bore you, so I won't do that. You're watching Channel 4, home of news4jacks.com. Channel 4 News in high definition starts now. In world-class athletic competitions, sometimes technology trumps talent. When every hundredth of a second counts, science and technology can help even the strongest athletes take their performance to the next level. Here's how. When Ariana Kukors won a record-breaking gold medal this summer, fluid dynamics engineer Dr. Year. Tim Wee felt okay. like a winner, too. This is Ari doing a flutter kick. For several years, Dr. Wee has been working with Ariana and the U.S. swim team. Here, the velocity vectors are perpendicular to the feet. Using experimental flow analysis techniques to help them increase their power and speed. It's basically using what we know about the physics of fluids or fluid flow and apply it to a very applied problem like a swimmer. See if we can't get the swimmer to swim better. Combining mathematics and stop motion technology, the system measures the flow the swimmer generates and calculates the thrust in every stroke. So whatever force is at that line, that's the force she's generating. In an individual race, every little bit of technique is going to add up. But it's more than swimming. Today, Dr. John Vaccaro is helping Dr. Wee set up for the next phase of his research, using wind tunnel tests to reduce drag and improve finishing times for the U.S. skeleton team. You can actually look at your movements and, and see how it really changes your drag so you can make sure you don't do those uh, when, the, uh, when you're actually in the competition. From sleds to swimming, the goal is the same, becoming the fastest and crossing the finish line first. Okay, let's do... something that I may know a little about. If you love to cook, not that part, but if you whipped up some disasters, that part, 
Even the best re recipes can sometimes go wrong. Yes, they can. With today's discoveries and breakthroughs, a nationally recognized scientist and chef, that's right, the two together, is going to give you a little bit of milk, uh, chemistry, and cooking. One cup of milk, three eggs. Long before she was a cook, Shirley Poirier was a biochemist. She says science is the key to understanding what goes right and wrong in the kitchen. Cooking is chemistry. It's essentially chemical reactions. Like what happens when you put chopped red cabbage into a hot pan. Can you see how it's turning blue? A disgusting blue. That's because these anthocyanin pigments have to stay acidic to stay red. Heat breaks down the red anthocyanide pigment, changing it from an acid to an alkaline, causing the color to change. Add some vinegar to increase the acidity, and the cabbage is red again. Baking soda will change it back to blue. This is chemistry in action. Cooking vegetables like asparagus causes a different kind of reaction in tiny air cells on the surface of boiling water. If we plunge them in boiling water, we pop these cells and they suddenly become much brighter green. Longer cooking, not so good. It causes the plant's cell walls to shrink and release acid. And so acid starts gushing out of the cells. And with acid in the water, it turns cooked green vegetables yucky, carmy, dry. And that pretty fruit bowl on your counter? Literally overnight, you can go from this nice green banana to this, an overthrow banana. The culprit here is emptying the gas. Given off by apples and even the bananas themselves, it can ruin your perfect fruit bowl. But put an apple in a paper bag with an unripe avocado, and the ethylene gas will work for you overnight. So we use this as a quick way to work. Shirley says understanding a little chemistry can help any cook. You may still mess up, but you know why. And when it works, this kind of chemistry can be downright delicious. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's, uh, had to do at least one outside of physics. And now for the last one. On your side, breaking news, live team coverage, and the Tri-State's most accurate forecast. This is my news at 5.30. And Secrets Revealed will show you how they do some of those fancy tricks you see on sports TV. What did television, science, and sports have in common? A lot more than you think, which makes them something you got to see. It's almost impossible to watch a sporting event and not notice all the little extras on the screen. TV networks have turned to scientists to create that unique look that is, well, not all that unique anymore. But that still doesn't answer the question, just how do they get that yellow line on the field? We instrument the broadcast cameras. We know where the camera is pointed and we know where the, how the camera is zoomed. By using mathematics, we can project graphics onto the football field. Computer scientists and electrical engineers at Sports Vision use chroma keying, just like we do with Steve Raleigh's weather maps, to superimpose the first down line. But that's not all. I see Michael splits away. In NASCAR, they make the invisible visible. You can't see it. It's, it's air traveling over the, the uh, car. Scientists use advanced fluid algorithms to see drafting, how air flows over a car. They track the cars with GPS and are able to create real-time graphics to show what's happening, even at speeds of 200 miles per hour. So we can track all 43 race cars five times a second an accuracy of one inch. As for baseball, cameras not only track a pitch, but also the pitcher. A pitcher was underperforming, and they looked back at our pitching data and found that uh, their release point had changed. In golf, radar measures the club speed and ball speed. Soccer has something similar called LIDAR that uses infrared light to reflect off... Okay. So, that's what you have. And you've seen an example of the form, what we said, and how they use. Now, is it the best thing since sliced cheese? The answer is no. Do they all come off fantastic? The answer is no. There are times when the film crew goes out and films a scientist and comes back and says, can't use that one. Because no one will understand what it is that he, and unfortunately in most cases, is he, is talking about. 
Now, <coughs> when this program got started in 2000, uh, 2000, there were 19 stations. Last year, 2010, that's where they were. Audience reach in the U.S., roughly 47 million. Internationally, and the countries with the red dots, roughly 200 million. Does it pay for itself? Answer is no. But the unintended consequence that's come out of it is that all of a sudden you've got about 20 scientific societies that are not talking to each other. <laughs> who are beginning to say that, yes, we also need to do something about this. We also need to have conversations with John Q. Public. We also need to have conversations with our members of Congress. We believe that we've gone a long way to help scientists see the importance of better public communication. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that up front, one of the most difficult things to do was to get a scientist to come online and actually agree to talk about his or her science. It's getting a little bit better. It was almost impossible in some places to get the researcher to come out of the lab and talk about, yes, this is what it's good for. We're getting better there. There is some evidence which shows that <coughs> this is helping to build a better public image of who we are as scientists. So in conclusion, what do I believe? I believe that awareness and appreciation, I will admit, don't do much education here, but you're trying to make the public aware of what science does and to appreciate the role that science has in their life. What's my secret hope? My secret hope is that some kid will see this on TV one night, will walk into class the next morning and say, teach, I saw this on TV last night. How does that really work? And start a conversation. So we believe that awareness and appreciation plus scientific literacy plus increased involvement of the scientific community, that's you, will equal to a society of appropriate role, authority, of science in the decision-making process, leading to an approved quality of life. Now, <coughs> Vern is no longer there, but I always have to use this slide. And the reason is this. If you walk on the hill and want to have a conversation, take a student with you. <laughs> They'll talk to you. You may not get in, but the student always gets an audience. Take them in. So the last word is that as scientists, we have to be involved. We've got to do that. That we have to learn to tell our story. Because if we don't, no one else will. That we must take control of our science. It turns out that there are a lot of people who are willing to take control of our science. One of the things I remember well is years ago when a um, member of Congress said to me when I walked in one day to talk about funding for education and George Brown, who a uh, congressman from California. George is no longer with us. But George, when I walked in and started talking, and I had been there enough time that he knew who I was, and pardon the French, but he said, Jim, I can't figure out why the hell you're here. 